Awesome, y'all. So uh, sorry for that slow start, um, but my name is Max. I am with uh, State Organizer with Texas Climate Jobs Project, and I am here to do a little presentation on climate justice. I'm also a DSA member and part of the committee that's working on this green uh, climate program in schools. Uh, so for this presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about climate justice in our schools and what that looks like. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of different things just in general. What are we pushing for, like as far as clean energy, energy efficiency and things like that, but also some other pieces, too, as far as how do we get these clean jobs that we're creating to be union jobs? How do we support our unions that are in schools? And then how do we get power in schools? Uh, so I guess we can go ahead and move forward. And thanks, Matt. I appreciate you <laughs> leading this. Cool. So there's three main categories. I kind of just touched on it a little bit, but clean energy and energy efficiency. This is probably the piece that is very connected to the platform we've built in our committee, just talking about the different things we're pushing for. Uh, this is something that uh, here in Austin, we're hoping to see a lot get done. Uh, we also are looking at section two, which is going to be on union labor. We're going to talk about unions and schools. And I have two uh, other organizers here, Ryan Pollock with IBW 520 and the Matt Inman with Education Austin. We're going to speak a little bit about their unions uh, and what that looks like in schools. Uh, we're also going to look at right to work and how we navigate that and how we get around it here. And then the last piece is organizing strategies. We're going to talk a little bit about the board of trustees, you know, where's power held in the schools? How do we get money to push for things we want? Um, and that's something that, as far as we're concerned, is about getting decarbonized uh, policies or decarbonization at schools, but also how do we get more pay for workers? Um, how do we get more benefits and more power to workers? Um, cool. So we can go ahead and jump onto the next section. Uh, clean energy and energy efficiency. We can go ahead to, uh, so just right off the bat, I want to ask everyone if they'd be interested in the chat, just kind of saying, what does climate justice look like to you? Um, we can also have people just popcorn out. I don't think we have a super big group, but if anyone has ideas, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, what climate justice look like, looks like. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I saw Alice, you posted that. I think that's another thing too. Yeah. Right, y'all. So I like the I like the comments I'm seeing. I think we're hitting in a lot of different things, which is really nice. Um, in a lot of ways, I think some people at face value just see like, oh yeah, solar panels. That's that's clean energy. But really, there's a lot of different dimensions to what climate justice looks like. Um, we're looking at you know climate justice and companies, uh, racial justice uh, embodies racial justice, social justice, uh, labor justice, essentially any justice in 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 the stratosphere. <laughs> um, so we can go ahead and jump to the next question. I'm sorry, next slide. Um, so for us, what we're defining as climate justice priorities are really built around the schools and what we're doing here in AISD. Um, we've broken it down into five central, uh, I guess, tenets, you would call it, of what we're really pushing for. First being research and planning, second being infrastructure and facility repairs, third being community health and safety, four being clean energy alternatives, and five being education and workforce development. Uh, so we can just jump in through here if you want to go ahead, Matt. So research and planning, uh, this is a really necessary starting point in a carbon-free and healthy schools campaign. Um, it's important to identify existing deficiencies so we can set goals and measure progress. There are some really valuable tools that get, exist in Texas that can be used for free by a lot of districts. Uh, for example, the state of Texas actually provides energy audits entirely for free for any K-12 through public ISD. Um, what that means is that you can have the state of Texas come in determine how you're using your energy, look for points of waste and help create a plan for you so that way you can work to improve your energy efficiency and actually get it so you're saving a lot more money on utility costs. Uh, that's free through, for every single school district. Sometimes local energy uh, uh, institutions would do that too, like CPS Energy in San Antonio, Center Point in Houston. Uh, but these resources exist and they're really, really easy for schools to use. It's just that they don't always use them. Um, so we can click to the next slide. Uh, so some more examples here, building assessments, seeing where the schools are at, 
solar feasibility studies. You can't build solar panels on the roof if your roof's about to cave in. Um, equity audits to make sure that funding's being equitably, equitably dispersed throughout the district. Um, jump into the next slide. Cool, next big thing, infrastructure and facility repairs, making sure that we're doing regular maintenance and repairs to ensure that facilities remain energy efficient and suitable for use. Um, to us, you know, we don't want students and teachers working in buildings that are falling apart. A big issue here in Austin is that HVAC systems are not working efficiently. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, entire classrooms, entire schools where students are just sweating and miserable the whole time. And I say miserable, but it's not even just a question of comfort. It really is a health concern. Um, you know, in Texas heat, when you think of like cities like Houston, Austin, San Antonio, this is something that's unacceptable and we really need to do better. Um, so you can jump to the next slide here, Matt. Cool, so like I said, HVAC repair, uh, system repairs, roof repairs, window door replacement, building envelope upgrades. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff here, but it's all designed to make sure that we're making our buildings as efficient as possible uh, so that they work well for everyone. Uh, and also so that we're saving money in the process. If you have a fantastic HVAC system, but you have holes in the roof or windows that don't close, air is going to escape and it's a lot of waste of energy. Cool. And I think I saw that uh, link you shared down there, Matt, in the chat. And I think that's a really impactful story. Um, I've heard lots of stories. I'm sure you've heard many, Matt, um, of what people have experienced. And it's just, it's not acceptable. Uh, On to the next slide. Uh, so kind of building off of that to community health and safety, um, looking just past utility savings, uh, looking past efficiency. Um, some repairs are just absolutely necessary for the health, safety, and well-being of workers and students. That's just what it is. Um, to the next slide. Uh, so, you know, we're looking at lead pipes. Um, something that's quite terrible to hear is that in Houston ISD, I learned recently that there's 84% of schools still have lead pipes. Um, that is significant. And I know of a coalition there that's actually working to push for them to simply invest, not even in new pipes, which are super expensive, but just getting filters. Um, the money exists to do that. The school just doesn't want to invest the resources. Um, that's not okay. And we know that the impacts of that is, is uh, just terrible on future generations. Um, also getting rid of asbestos, um, plumbing repairs. Obviously, we want to be able to use the plumbing system. If the plumbing system doesn't work, that's a health issue. You got to be able to use water. You got to have running water. At the same time, leaks can lead to mold and mildew. Uh, electrical repairs, we don't want, like, this isn't as common, but, you know, people getting shocked or getting hurt from that. Um, and then also with HVAC revisiting that and roof revisiting that, you know, exposure to extreme weather. Uh, whenever it's storming, there shouldn't be a concern of rain leaking in the building. Uh, whenever it's above 100 degrees outside, we shouldn't be approaching that inside as well. That's not what we should have. All right, we can jump to the next slide. Cool. Clean energy alternatives, um, in addition to greater energy efficiency, a comprehensive uh, CFHS campaign is going to need to have clean energy alternatives and what that looks like. And you can hit the next slide here, Matt. Um, it's just big picture things like solar power systems, pushing for electric school buses, getting electrical vehicle charging stations on campuses. Uh, these are a way to make sure that we're maximizing our clean energy use. Uh, so we're not just making our energy use efficient, but we're taking ourselves away from carbon and use, decarbonizing entirely. All right, to the next slide. And then education and workforce development. Uh, so we need to create more opportunities in the K through 12 public school system so students can learn about climate change and continue to pursue careers in clean energy. Um, and to the next slide to see what that looks like. Uh, you know, we're talking about job training for energy efficiency, making sure workers know um, how to like, operate these new technologies we're bringing to schools, climate curriculum in K through 12 classrooms. Uh, students need to be informed about this. It needs to be part of what we're learning. CTE programs and sustainability, and then also work-based learning opportunities and pre-apprenticeship programs. This is something that I think we're gonna to touch in a little bit from Ryan about the trades piece, um, but finding opportunities of getting students to learn about, hey, you can be a part of the clean energy future and get a really good job that's gonna pay well, take care of you, give you benefits, healthcare, a pension, um, and that's pretty much through the trades. <laughs> uh, so that's something that like needs to be more exposed to a lot of students. Cool, so we can jump to the next slide. And that takes us out of our platform and what the demands really look like. Now we're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and look at the labor side of it. Um, who are the big leaders in this campaign? Who are the folks like working in these schools? Uh, what are the unions that represent them and how do they work to get build union power in schools? Uh, so to the next slide. 
I've got another uh, popcorn question. Uh, I know y'all are eager to have interaction here. <laughs> so uh, for here, I wanna ask you if they can name some of the labor unions that find work in schools. And also if you are a union member, uh, I encourage you to shout it out and let us know because it's always great to see our union members at our presentations. Awesome, y'all. So I see a lot of uh, people here who are union members, but also people sharing the unions that are there. Um, I don't think the school drivers here in Austin are, are ATU. I believe they're with Education Austin. Matt can probably confirm that, but... That's, um, that's correct. Cool. And then, yes, I see uh, we're also throwing out some of the different unions in schools. Um, yes, they do do work at schools. Uh, I don't know if you want to jump to the next slide, Matt, but... Uh, here's a little picture of all the different unions that do work in schools in different places throughout uh, Texas. Um, you know, we're looking at electricians, we're looking at painters and glazers, we're looking at teachers, we're looking at laborers, we're looking at plumbers and pipe fitters. Uh, the amount of work that each of these unions does in schools in each city differs, and it depends on a lot of different factors that we're going to dive into. But these are the different unions that have like career opportunity to be doing jobs, creating good union jobs in schools. Cool, so we can jump to the next slide. And yeah, how do we navigate right to work laws? Uh, so this is, I think the next slide, we're gonna hand it over to, actually, no, I keep the next slide, sorry. But we're gonna talk a little bit about how teachers navigate right to work laws, or rather not just teachers, but the entire uh, education staffs, how they work around uh, right to work laws. So you can jump to the next slide, Matt. So first, I think it's important just to have an understanding of collective bargaining. Uh, so this is pretty much the gold standard power that unions fight for. Um, it's the process in which working people through their unions can negotiate contracts. Uh, these are legally binding contracts that outline the terms of employment, and that includes everything from pay, benefits, hours, leave, more, every right you get. Um, includes rights like grievances to be able to fight if, uh, if you think a manager is being unfair to you or doing something wrong, you can challenge that, um, get your discipline overturned. Uh, and the negotiated contracts are legally protected, um, so you can hold your employers accountable. Uh, the problem in Texas is that they've made it uh, so that collective bargaining is prohibited for most public employees in Texas, and this includes public school teachers and staff. Uh, so jumping to the next slide, what, they, what we see uh, teachers unions fight for here in Texas is elected consultation. Um, this is a system in which workers uh, in a district can vote for an employee organization to represent them, their local union. Uh, Mac can probably Feel free to jump in, by the way, if you want to add anything. But I know that here in Education Austin, this is something they fought hard to get um, and that they're voted for to be the representatives for their employees. The employing organization is entitled to monthly meetings with administrators. They can bring forward concerns, grievances, or recommendations, and more. Uh, there is a process of a back and forth with negotiations and some counter proposals. Um, and generally, when there is a disagreement, it can be presented to the Board of Trustees. So it is documented. Um, Matt, I don't know if you want to add anything to that piece. Yeah, I just, I can add um, yeah, everything spot on so far. Um, the, the kind of the last piece of it too that you were just talking about in terms of um, uh, presenting it to the board. So we have a mechanism called impasse. So essentially if, um, you know, we are negotiating with the administration on a proposal and we reach what is, you know, sort of impasse or deadlock, um, it can then be presented to the board and the trustees ultimately vote to decide the outcome. So for an example, you know, if we were to not get to where we want to with our compensation proposal this year, we could theoretically take it to impasse and um, that would essentially, you know, each side would, you know, present to the board um, and they would be the ultimate deciding vote. So that's sort of like the final mechanism. And, and it, this is sort of, elected consultation is kind of a funny name, but it's, it's very much like meet and confer. Um, and in terms of just general processes, I think it's it's about as good as we can get without actually having collective bargaining. And I think in some instances, it it does provide us with some 
maybe like latitude or sort of expanded scope that we may not have already have had with a collective bargaining agreement. So pros and cons, of course, but you know, we are pushing as about as hard as we can get without changing the law, literally speaking. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, well, you can uh, jump ahead to the next slide then. Um, cool. So I just included two quotes here because uh, there's two awesome leaders that I wanted to give some a bit of a platform to. So first, Ken Zarefis here with Education Austin. Uh, we've gained considerable pay raises. We've seen improvements to our insurance policy, and we've created new teacher evaluation practices. So there's some significant victories made through the elected consultation. And then, Matt, if you want to jump to the next slide, too, I also included a quote from Alejandro Lopez from San Antonio Alliance president. Um, consultation ensures there's a space where distinct district leadership is required to meet with elected representatives from the union to discuss important topics that affect workers across the district. Um, these are two of the strongest AFTs in Texas, and I think both are very proud of the elected consultation they fought for because it really gives uh, workers in Texas the best possible uh, opportunity to fight uh, for what they deserve. All right, so we can jump to the next slide here. And I'm going to turn it over to Ryan here if you want to lead a little bit, but uh, please feel welcome to lean on me um, a little bit if you'd like, but to talk a little bit about what trade unions here in Texas look like uh, as far as school construction work. So as far as school construction work goes, um, there's one major reason why the trades unions do most of the work for Austin ISD, uh, but not quite so much in most of the rest of the state. The main thing being uh, how prevailing wage works. So in the state of Texas, prevailing wage needs to be set by every single public body not just statewide or or by you know major areas and all that so austin isd sets their own prevailing wage um text dot has their own prevailing wage bastrop isd has their own prevailing wage and there are two legal ways you can do it according to uh state government code chapter 2258 and that is by either one adopting the um uh, what do you call it, the wage surveys um, and the rates as in accordance with Davis-Bacon and all of its amendments or by conducting and funding your own independent public survey. Public surveys, your, you know, your own independent surveys are expensive and they're not very reliable. So not many, um, you know, public bodies opt for that option. The easiest and simplest way is to just go with Davis-Bacon, but a lot of uh, school boards and all that will say that that uh, you know Davis Bacon rates are too high because they're you know Davis Bacon surveys will pretty much ask you know send surveys to the unions and say well you know what are they paying okay cool that's that's the Davis Bacon rate so <clears throat> a lot of surrounding areas like Bastrop ISD Bastrop ISD claims that they have done an independent public survey, but the, the wording is kind of weird. So they can get away with a lot of things and set their prevailing wage rates extremely low. I think in Bastrop, it's $17 an hour total for a journey level electrician. That's benefits, everything, all that included. It's that's it's exceptionally low. Um, whereas compare that to what our journey level rates are in IBW Local 520 here in Austin, it's 31.52 currently about to actually as of next week it'll be 32 dollars even just on the check plus another um almost 10 dollars in benefits on top of that so there's, there's quite a gap there and that makes it you know if they're the prevailing wage rate is not set with davis bacon then it makes it difficult for union signatory contractors to be able to compete with these low road contractors and those low road contractors aren't investing in workers who have the proper training have experience work safely all that stuff they're not just cutting corners on on wages they're cutting corners on you know do these people even know how to do this work you know because nobody who knows how to do this well uh, in their right mind will work for those wages when they have plenty of other options available. Um, and so if they're cutting corners there, they're also cutting corners on safety. They're cutting corners on uh, material, all sorts of things. So you're getting an inferior product because it's not built well. Um, 
you're not investing in the community. These are our tax dollars, right? That's supposed to be, um, we're supposed to be investing in ourselves with that, in our communities, in, in our schools. So that's not going back into the workforce. It's not going back into training, you know, these uh with austin isd in particular you know this this these funds are for education and why are we educating our students to be productive members of society all that stuff have have all these things well um we're not even providing them good jobs when they come out of there if if we're using that that tax dollar to to give them a low wage unsafe job where um they're probably they, they have a higher chance of not coming home at the end of the day. And Texas is one of the only states in the entire union that doesn't require workers' compensation. All union signatory contractors are required to carry workers' compensation. There's so many things. Our, we train our, our, our members are required to go through training, um, all sorts of classes. We, you know, in the interest of the union, or it's in the interest of the union that all of our members are as highly trained work as safely as possible and are as valuable as possible. We want them to, to move up in their career and advance and learn new things and grow and bring up those who are coming up behind them as well, teach them that that's not the same interest of, you know, these low road contractors. It's not in their interest to make valuable workers to uh, make sure that everyone's getting home safe because they'll just replace them. It's not a big deal for them. So, you know, it, when we, uh, or I guess I should go back to um, in 2014, it, as the union started gaining a bit more power, there was a, a campaign around here that was started by Workers Defense Project. Because before 2014, for at least some period of time, I'm not sure how long, Austin ISD wasn't setting their prevailing wage in accordance with David Bacon. They had extremely low prevailing wage. So we couldn't compete. The the organized trades couldn't compete. And I think 2013, according to a study we did after this campaign, we IBW Local 520 only did about 5% of Austin ISD's total work. Um, we, uh, we took, we joined this coalition to, uh, and this campaign in order to put the pressure on Austin ISD school board for them to change how they calculate Davis Bacon so that they're now calculating it legally. Um, over 70% of public bodies in Texas do calculate it illegally. We have to fight that. Um, so this all goes along with that. But in IS, in Austin ISD, they there's like a, a year long plus campaign to get them to correct that. We eventually won. And they now and have since been setting their prevailing wage rate in accordance with Davis Bacon. And the share of the Austin ISD work done by IBEW electricians has increased from only 5% to almost 80%. And that happened with, within just a, a year or two of correcting that prevailing wage rate. So we want to make sure that's going on here. We're, we're also working on correcting that in surrounding areas and, and would eventually like to get a statewide campaign going on. But that's why prevailing wage is so important, particularly in a right to work state like Texas. Cool. Thank you for sharing that, Ryan. Um, yeah, that was perfect. That that sums it up exactly. You know, the prevailing wage uh, Davis Bacon standard here in AISD is huge. It means that these jobs that we create in schools here uh, whether it's from fixing HVAC systems, installing solar panels, whatever it may be, those are going to be union jobs. Uh, so Matt, I did a terrible job of actually saying to hit next on the slides here. So let's click through. Um, oh, shoot, I never did fix this slide. Uh, so just ignore where it says date there. There's supposed to be like some date counting thing, but it doesn't really mean that much. Um, I want to give just a quick overview of what the contracting process looks like. And um, Ryan, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but as I understand it, essentially when a project is announced, they're going to have contractors submit bids. The ISD is going to review those bids and then they award the contract. Um, and if you hit next slide, Matt. Um, yeah, I just want to throw in um, oh, yeah. in that bidding process. So, um, you know, it says you have to, well, I guess we'll get to that here, but going with the, the public body has to go with the one that offers the most value. So not necessarily the lowest bid. Um, there's all sorts of different ways you can, calculate value it's all pretty gray 
but oftentimes they're going to go with the lowest bidder. And the big problem with that is that lowest bidder, like I said, they're, they aren't as safe. Um, so you're going to have more accidents, uh, possibly serious ones that's going to add costs and also damage the community in general. Um, Whereas, uh, uh, and, and they're less trained, so you're getting an inferior product. You know, it's oftentimes that we'll have these big public projects that end up going, being awarded to these low road contractors. And almost, almost every time, especially lately, it seems so many of these major projects, they end up having to bring in a union contractor to take over and fix everything, which only adds more costs. Uh, much more cost than it would have been originally, um, and and so yeah, it's it's just it's cheaper to just go with us the first time, even though that sticker price may be a little bit higher. Right, cool. That's perfect. Uh, you want to jump to the next slide, Matt? Um, okay, so Ryan talked about Davis Bacon already, so we can jump to the next slide. Um, I did want to just show like some of these numbers. I don't know how accurate this is. I did a lot of searching to try to find a local city wage um, survey. And I found one from UT that did one for Austin. And this is what they determined the wages should be versus at the time in 2020, what the federal wages were. Um, I know you already highlighted this, Ryan, but the gap is just huge. It's, it's so different and it's like criminally underpaying workers. Um, I guess it's legal, but it's, it's essentially criminal. Um, you can jump to the next slide, Matt. Um, and cool, I guess you talked a little bit about apprentices too, Ryan, but is there anything you feel like adding specifically? Yeah, I'd, I'd argue that uh, those rates actually like wouldn't be legal in accordance with the law, but that's what we're arguing in courts right now. <laughs> oh, I guess, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> um, so as far as the apprenticeship programs, like we're working on... Um, we're working with a lot of local school districts on building apprenticeship programs and integrating those into the school system because like I didn't become an electrician until I was 28. Um, if I had known about this, like it's, it's really the best kept secret. Unfortunately, like I have, I have kids coming in who are like fresh out of high school and wanting to be electricians or they've already been working as an electrician with their dad or something like that. And they're really on top of it. And I'm just like, oh my God, like you have no idea how made you have it right now. Like these kids will possibly be able to afford a home in Austin by the time they're like 24. It's, it's wild and no, no debt, no, no college debt, anything like that. So um, it's, it's important for us to be in these spaces because it offers another way um, for a lot of people that don't have opportunities. Otherwise um, there's so much opportunities with this where, where other paths don't exist. You know, college may not be an option for most people. Um, they don't have the resources to even go out on their own, all that, but these apprenticeships are a path to prosperity and, and all the freedoms that, and, and joys that come with that. So the more, unions are around the the more we can invest in these programs and, and the more work we can do to get them started and actually get them uh well-paying jobs after that with um uh like our insurance our insurance covers the entire family with no premiums whatsoever um retirement all that stuff you know it's 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 an amazing opportunity and we want more people to be able to have that opportunity and have this this skill that can't ever be taken away from them Absolutely. Cool. Um, bef before we jump ahead, I did want to mention one last thing, because I'm not sure if we highlighted it. Um, but uh, we, we did look into the idea just because we felt like it was worth looking, even though it's here in Texas, is that when we create, like with the board of trustees, that when they create a process for picking their best value contracts, uh, one question we thought was, well, what if they just make that you have to consider union status as best value? Um, that is not legal here in Texas. Uh, that's part of their right to work. And that's why we're working around that. So for teachers, you know, having to deal with the issue of no collective bargaining for trades workers, we can't just get that to be one of the deciding factors. Like a school can't just choose to use union workers simply because they're union. So the, the, the Davis-Bacon wages, like we talked about, was one way to level the playing field. So that way, uh, 
you know, it's much, much easier for a union to outbid or compete with these non-union contractors. And the same here, we realized that uh, training does tie into best value. And so we can make a requirement or stipulation like, hey, ISDs, uh, you should have to require that all of your workers who are doing work on your sites have gone through a DOL, Department of Labor Certified Program. This is how we make sure they're well-trained, they do the job right, they're safe, all these different pieces to it. Um, a lot of non-union contractors, like Ryan said, skimp out on that and don't make their workers do that. Uh, so this helps to benefit to make sure that we're actually getting union workers in there, but also just to make sure we have safe and well-qualified workers in there. Um, cool. Uh, Matt, you can jump to the next slide. And I think we're diving into organizing strategies, which I think, Matt, you might be good to cover for this section. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Okay, let me reread what I have here. So I have all these little windows. In. Okay, who holds power in a school district? Subtext, who do we organize? Another uh, craving for interaction. Type it in the chat. Say it out loud. Type stack. So we are good. It's in the school board. Any other? Ideas, suggestions, thoughts? Parents? Okay. Well, actually, I now I was talking to Max about this earlier, and I, and I actually reread it. Uh, Superintendent, Ryan, yes, definitely. Um, you know, you can kind of interpret these questions different uh, ways, yes. The, the SBOE or the TA would also potentially be, you know, a, a decision maker in the in this public school process. Um, but you know, who holds power? Right? You know, we typically, I think, as leftists, think of oh, it's with the workers, which is true. Um, but we also think of too, you know, when we think talk about like theory of change, right? We tend to talk about like who is the decision maker that can make change happen, right? That tends to be someone who also holds power. Um, and then, you know, kind of the subtext question of who do we organize, right? As well, it's employees, it's parents, it's community members, um, but it's also, you know, school board members and the superintendent, because ultimately those are your decision makers and they ultimately have kind of, at least sort of at the local level and the ISD level, right? They have the, the lev they, they're able to push the levers that, you know, give us the changes that we want, whether that be compensation, working conditions, et cetera. So, yeah. All, all, all relevant and good answers. Let's see the next slide. Okay. Where is the power? This is a good picture of Ken um, at the rally we had a couple weeks ago. Um, also, any of you who are there, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it was an awesome rally, great turnout, um, made a big splash. And, um, you know, it's definitely like a, I shouldn't say a starting point, but sort of a segue point and escalation. Um, of our campaign. Um, yeah, and like this slide says, the workers must organize the Board of Trustees because ultimately, you know, we kind of think about the way that the district even maps it out, right, is it's sort of like, so I'm trying to do, you have like <clears throat> the community is at the top. And so that's sort of like the, who they value is. They elect the trustees and the trustees hire and sort of monitor and do the policy that the superintendent or the CEO of the district uh, implements, right? So that's kind of like the decision level making hierarchy. So realistically, like, you know, the, the board members don't write the budget, like they're not the ones that are literally like pigeon scratching all the line items, but they are the ones that ultimately approve it. And the little windows over. Okay, yeah, so here's notable powers, right? So they select, hire, and review the performance of the superintendent. They review and approve the annual budget. Um, they approve the submission of bond packages. So if the district were to seek a bond, say like in the fall, they would they would do that. Uh, oh, whoa, sorry, y'all. Don't know what I did there. Slideshow. Oh, here we go. So um, and Max made a good note on the slide. So you get to do all of this, get yelled at by the public. Um, learn umpteen gajillion different things in school and education policy, all unpaid. 
Um, so in a lot of ways, it's a thankless position, um, but it also speaks to the importance of having like highly competent and driven trustees on the board because it makes our job as a union, as educators, as parents, as community members, a bit more of a slog when we don't have either a trustees that are you know willing to kind of get after it and hold administration accountable, or b um, kind of just in the back seat and let you know the administration sort of drive the car completely. Um, yeah, and again, this is this the main part of this is that they are the body that runs the district in terms of the oversight just like almost like if you think of like a private company board any type of board they are they are a corporate board okay um how do we build that power yeah so organize the board members for their votes um and win issues um that's that's the meat and potatoes of it basically um yeah this is a good slide to um the next together so this is our current board of trustees. Um, we have nine, seven um, member districts or single member districts, excuse me, um, that are geographical um, or demographic based. And then we have two at large positions. Um, as you can see, um, four, five of the nine seats are up for reelection in this coming November election. Um, so this is a big, we see as a big opportunity um, to not only flip the board, but also really put people in seats that will vote our way on issues. I mean, just like any other, you know, political body, right? You know, ultimately your goal is to, you know, have a voting majority that will side with you on your issues that are, you know, in our case, pro-labor, um, pro-worker, pro-student, you know, anti-micromanagement, anti, -micromanagement, anti shitty working conditions, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I think if we were to, if we were to go into a vote tomorrow on, depending on the issue, right? I think we kind of view it as, right now the board is kind of split into thirds. We have three trustees that are super solid. We have three that are kind of like, I wouldn't say outright anti, but certainly are not singing our praises. And then we have three that kind of just sit in the middle and don't really take a firm stance, but ultimately, right, we need five votes to win any of our issues because there's nine trustees, right? Um, and so it's kind of this sort of mushy third that sits, that's kind of our difficulty right now. But again, like I said, these five seats up for a re-election in the fall uh, present us with a huge opportunity um, to kind of flip the script, flip the board. Um, and I will add too that the new information i'm sure many of you have seen that the superintendent has announced her departure we'll be going back to dallas um shortly so um not only do we have a chance to flip the board but that board will then determine who the new superintendent is or the ceo um, and that really will shape um you know the course of the district in a lot of ways for the next several years at a minimum i mean the terms are two years for trustees but um you know the the superintendent's tenure lasts in theory longer than 18 months like it has this last go around so um, yeah, a lot of potential big wins uh, could be won um yeah and so this slide obviously so talking about project funding right because you know going back to what we're talking about with um climate jobs of course is like how do we actually pay for this like what what's the strategy from so taking it from like the abstract of you know, like climate justice uh, to like, how do we win stuff at the local level? And, and I think this slide does a good job. It's talking about the annual budget. We're talking about bonds. We're talking about federal grants. Um, Anna, I just saw your question. Um, no, in only if because we don't know who will apply or how that, I mean, certainly I think if people publicly announced that they were running and we'd be like, oh, that's probably a good person. But at least during the last go around, it was pretty secretive um, and they do that intentionally because I guess to protect the interests of the people applying. I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I certainly think, um, you know, there will be whispers in the in the ether, but certainly, I mean, you know, 
I, we definitely do that. I should, I should clarify. We definitely do that on the school board side. Like we absolutely are like in the process of trying to get find encouraged to run candidates for the school board. We don't necessarily, we have the ability, I think, to give say to like the profile kind of the process a little bit, but we ultimately like, you know, that is a board, it'll be like the board's kind of decision. And, you know, I think one of the things that we would have want, we'd like to see is just like more public input, more constituent input into how the profile is built, how the process works, who's helping go through applications, et cetera, et cetera. Because, you know, again, the board doesn't like they, the nine trustees don't do this, like they'll hire a consulting firm who will do it. And so there's like, I guess bits and pieces, but there's, I think, room for us to put sway into it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, always with the consulting firms for sure. Um, yeah, so the budgets um, reviewed annually and approved, um, usually in ju June. Um, there's been great stories coming out of lots of different locals the last few weeks. Um, you know, San Antonio Lions just won um, a three three percent raise for all school employees last week. Um, you know, I mean, some of the numbers are, are kind of mind boggling coming out of other districts, you know, I think you saw like Leander is at like an 8%, you know, a lot of the districts around Houston have, have upped the starting teacher pay to, you know, $59,000 plus, which is great. Um, so typically most districts will, will set to approve their budget in the sort of the May, June timeframe, because most districts are on a fiscal year of, you know, July 1 to the following calendar, you know, June 30. Um, yeah, and employee salary. So typically in any given school district in Texas and, and really anywhere, about 85% of the district's, you know, MO or maintenance operations budget goes to salary, <clears throat> just you know, dollars being paid in as a as a function of employees. Um, so one potential option that you know could be explored is taking a small portion of the MO but <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry, I just lost my voice. Um the MO budget, basically siphoning off a small chunk of that um, and using that um, as a way to invest in and upgrade um, facilities. And, and Max, you were telling me earlier there was a specific sort yeah. of use case so of this that's recent. A really good example um, is what we've seen in San Antonio ISD, and they actually just received their district an award at the recent energy summit that happened in, I guess it wasn't that recent, it was March, in um, here in Austin. But oh, since 2018, they've been uh, dedicating just small amounts of money from their MNO budget towards uh, projects that could go towards retrofitting, um, getting small things like just a couple LED lights, little things here and there, um, working on like a smarter plan of knowing when to like turn the lights off and stuff, uh, knowing when to drop the temperatures down or like AC lowering it so that they're not using too much. Um, and they've invested about 800K into these projects, uh, maybe closer to 900K since the since 2018 um, and the same amount of time we've also realized about 5.9 million dollars in savings um, so it only takes a couple bits of investments and just some smart planning and you can have huge uh, savings just right away you know we're not saying we have to get like 30 solar panels to start seeing real savings you'll see it just from little investments um, and then once you have those big amounts of savings 5.9 million over like four years uh, that's money that can be reinvested into bigger projects, maybe solar panels. Uh, it could also be reinvested into teacher salaries, staff salaries. So there's a lot of potential with that money. Awesome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> school bonds. Um, so districts will sell bonds to fund big projects. Um, the most recent bond, 2017, is that my number right? I think that's right. Um, and the district is still working on improvements from that bond. Um, uh, and typically, well, I shouldn't say typically, they, you, we can't just like raise a bond to pay for like teacher salaries or, or employee salaries. It, they have to have specific purposes. So like I'm doing X, Y, Z at this campus, meaning like I'm installing an HVAC system or I'm you know, adding a wing to a building um, or I'm building a football field or something like that, right? It, it can't, they have to have specific sort of tangible purposes. Um, the bonds are repaid over time. Um, you know, we can do, you know, taxes and that's typically how they're levied. Uh, and we have to have an election to do that. So district can't just say like, 
uh, we authorize a bond and we're going to raise taxes, you know, they have to put it to the public. The public has to vote in favor of said bond um, in order for um, stuff for uh, the district to do the bond, uh, I should say. Um, and yes, Alice, you're correct. They, we can't pay salaries. I wish we could. God knows that would fix a lot of our problems here in Austin. Um, but yeah, we cannot pay salaries. Um, I think they look at it as sort of like, a, well, I mean, there's probably a lot of reasons as to why the subtlety exists, but um, it's sort of like a, salaries are obviously like ongoing expenditures, whereas like bonds, again, are, they have sort of discrete itemized requests, right? So it's like I'm, I'm building a project, I'm acquiring some land, et cetera. And then um, I should just add to, you know, the district had announced, sort of floated the idea a few months ago that maybe they were looking at a bond. They may still be, again, with the superintendent leaving and the different administration coming in, how likely is that now? We don't really know. But the other thing too that we look at is, you know, we've, been struggling a lot with the current superintendent, um, so we're super pleased that we'll be doing lots to shake up things in the fall, but um, certainly it's like, you know, our feeling as a union that, um, you know, we're not, the, the district and the superintendent have made our lives miserable and haven't really been able to acquiesce or compromise on a lot of things, so why should we throw our weight behind a bond if, and just give them carte blanche to do a bunch of stuff so it's kind of like a, so again, it's like a sort of a soft lever, soft power um, there as well, right? So again, it's not like we have a contract or an agreement that says we can negotiate the bond, but certainly, you know, our status and power of our members organizing, right, gives us that flexibility to, to kind of lend support either way. Um, so that's so kind of up in the air. We don't really know what's happening with that. And, you know, only time will tell how that goes. Um, and then finally, federal grants, right? So we have like um, ARPA, you know, the you know public school funding via ESSER. Um, the district got $175 million in ESSER funds, probably even more. Um, some good news on that front, um, you know, through consultation, we've been working on the compensation proposal um, and they actually included via ESSER funds in this last sort of counter proposal um, some stipends, like retention stipends, which is great because all year they've been saying we don't have any money to pay staff with ESSER funds. Well, lo and behold, we can apparently pay staff with ESSER funds, which we've always known that's the, to be the case, but, you know, we are making inroads there. Um, but yeah, it was basically just a lot of money. And it's great because obviously the pandemic, you know, really kicked the, the can in on, on public schools over the last two years. So it's much needed, but certainly, you know, doesn't go far enough, nor should we sort of, you know, assume that that will fix all of our woes. Um, yeah, and then the, the BIL, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, so, um, you know, the, the Action Plan for Building Better School Infrastructure has $500 million in grants, um, and then this Clean School Bus Program via the EPA is $500 million in rebates. Um, another bill that is potentially out there, too, in terms of, like, it's not infrastructure related, but it's kind of part of the testimony of the, just the testimony, sort of the, the hubbubaloo around, um, you know, the Chapter 313 agreements that's being negotiated with NXP right now is the potential for like the CHIPS Act to get funded, which would give the um, funding local municipality or, or public body um, direct rebates or grants from the federal government to offset the tax subsidies that they give out. So a lot of things in the air right now in terms of environmental and you know, getting monies like this back to districts, which is good. Kind of. Ooh, I wanted to jump in real quick and just add, uh, and, and Ryan can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I'm pretty sure that when you get projects funded fully by federal funding, uh, Davis Bacon wages are or prevailing wages are attached to it automatically. Even um, if they have a dollar of federal funding, it's Davis okay, Bacon. Okay, So these grants are fantastic because it helps schools. It doesn't come out of the school's budget in any way, and it's going to put union workers to work. <laughs> so um, we're really excited. And we actually were moving something on that second one, the, the BIL one in San Antonio and, and Houston. It's very, very early stages, but 
Um, that it's not something we're doing here in Austin. We have some different strategies here, but it is something we're trying to see in other cities too. Uh, cool. So if, if you want to jump ahead to this next slide, um, this is essentially the ending here. So it might be just better to like cut the recording here, Heather, and then maybe we want to uh, have this piece just be a conversation as a group, or I'm not really sure how the discussions are facilitated, but um, it might be good here just to think about things that we can do as, as DSA to, to mobilize our community and help support uh, all these campaigns and the work we're running. Yeah, sure. If we're going to open it up, I'm, uh, I'll go ahead and hit stop.